Yes, I, uh, we just started Cooler Heads Intelligence. Um, it's an interesting thing. I'll tell you a little bit about the name. Uh, as a marketer, I realized like, the hardest thing to do is to come up with a name of your company. <laughs> okay, because it seems like all the good names are taken, right? So you sit there and then you get together with your management team and that's what we stand around and talk about all kinds of things like, why don't we call it Decision EQ? No, that's taken. Why don't we call it Nimbility? No, that's like all crazy names are taken, right? All the crazy names, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. So I was really getting desperate. I was starting to panic. Like, we're starting this company. I can't figure out what the name is. We got everything else, the tools, the technology, the people. And so we sat around, and our chief technology officer said, well, you know what, Lauren? You're always talking about, over the years, how many times you've met all these marketers running around with their heads on fire. <laughs> and he said, why don't we call it Cooler Heads? I said, of course that's taken. I mean, come on, of course that's taken. We get the lawyers involved, we search around, no one has taken this name. So we realize it's either Kismet or something's really wrong with this name. I don't know, but I'm going with Kismet and we're, just, we're, we're now Cooler Heads Intelligence. But he's right about one thing. Over the 25 years that I've been in marketing, I've been dealing with marketing directors and CMOs, et cetera, it doesn't matter whether, you know, how, the technology has changed. When I started back in the day, it was, what, three broadcast networks, seven sisters, two sports magazines, and, and radio, right? And now it's five bazillion things, you know, 20 bazillion channels and nothing's on. Um, but the one thing that hasn't changed is the tendency to panic, okay? The tendency to panic, and even more so these days, right? Because look at all the things that marketers worry about. Data is a big part of it. Most marketers do not know what to do with their data. In fact, there are you know, just tons and tons of surveys out there, whether it's IBM, the, the CMO survey, all of these things. People just do not know what to do with all the data that they collect. Forget about big data. They're collecting transactional records, small data. Okay, as well as big data. They don't know what to do. But more importantly, when it comes to strategic decisions, you know, we talk about data analytics and optimizing programs at a very tactical level. But when it comes to strategic decisions about how much should I invest in my marketing? What am I gonna get from that investment? What are all my activities doing to drive sales? What's my CFO going to, to, to wanna know from me? This is what causes marketing leaders to panic. And to borrow a, a, a phrase from one of my favorite Charlie Daniels songs, it causes it, you know, consumers these days and all the mobile devices, et cetera, have, have, caused, uh, have caused marketers to run around, step in infection like their heads are on fire and their asses is catching, okay? That's where all of this has come from. And <clears throat> We are devoted to trying to chill out marketers by using data so they can know and, and they can stop guessing and start knowing what they're getting from their, you know, what they're getting from their marketing investment. So as we started to talk, and you know, my team makes fun of me all the time because I come up with all of these things, you know, heads on fire and so forth. And one of the things I came up with was I started a rogues gallery of what I call hot-headed marketers. And we, you know, one of our major pushes in our company is to try to make data analytics and the power of advanced and predictive analytics accessible to marketers, to not talk in the jargon, to not you know, belabor them with you know, all kinds of you know, technical terms. And it's hard because data scientists like to talk in jargon. It just makes the conversation about half as much time as it would take if we started to talk in real language. But one of the things we realized was like, we have met some characters over the years of working with marketers. And so I thought I'd introduce you to them and help you understand how we can chill them out with uh, some advanced and predictive analytics and a better understanding of their data. So we have, first off, the first rogue, okay, is Chicken Little. And Chicken Little is one of those marketers that goes around and looks you know, it goes to 17,000 focus groups, right? Travels around the country, does a bunch of focus groups, finds one focus group with one dude in it that says, I really hate that. I really hate that ad. 
It happened to us once when, when we were uh, at the Martin Agency and there was a Super Bowl spot for one of uh, our major clients, a fast casual restaurant, and tons of focus groups loving, okay, loving the ads, loving the spots, loving everything, and he chooses one focus group in one place that hated the Super Bowl spot. Now I say this because when you start to look at data, and you start to look at data in terms of messaging, you can use data, data in terms of understanding um, the creative, you cannot just look at one data point, one thing, and say the sky is falling. We've got to take this out. So there was millions of dollars spent on the Super Bowl spot that never ran because this one guy used this one piece of, of information and it just it killed the program. Think about how much money was lost and sat on the table because of that decision. So Chicken Little busted. The buckaroo, all right, this is the guy who shoots from the hip. Right, because of course he knows everything. And we recently had a client that's a buckaroo, despite all of the evidence, the data that said, you know what, television is going to work in this case. I know we love to hate television these days, but television still has an important role in driving awareness and driving um, understanding of what a brand can be. I admire him, he's like, no, we, we could use other things. Television, no television. Problem is, the data pointed in that direction. Now don't get me wrong, we are very much believers that it is human knowledge, human experience, plus data that equals the best decisions. But then what he needed to do was instead of asking us to manipulate the models, <laughs> which is what he asked us to do, he needed to sit down and say yes, the data does tell us that television's gonna work. But bottom line is, if we have to spend a million dollars on production for basically a $2 million investment in television, it doesn't make real financial sense. Let's put all of the things that we know, our human knowledge, our experience, and our data together to be able to come up with a good decision about what marketing should be doing and investing in. So, he was definitely busted for that, being a buckaroo. <laughs> I love this one. This is the wizard, right? This is the, you've met these people, right? The wizard mesmerizes with his or her status uh, and perceived expertise. There's always somebody in the room that it doesn't matter what's going on, everybody's afraid to argue with, everybody's afraid to push back on, um, and everybody's afraid that if somehow they go with a data-driven decision. They have removed the magic from marketing. I remember talking to the head of an agency in Chicago, and we talked about the importance of data-driven support for their programs. And he said, but Lauren, where's the magic? Where's the magic? I don't, I don't understand. The bottom line is, if you do not understand what impact your program is going to have, on the future of your business, what seeps in is guessing and fear. And nothing kills creativity and the magic more than being afraid, okay? And so for us, it was a matter of talking to him about being able to remove the mystery of marketing without removing the magic. And that's what advanced and predictive analytics can do. The power of predictive analytics is, can help you stop guessing and start knowing so that you can have the confidence to do things that you might otherwise not be able to do or be afraid to do because at the end of the day, somebody's gonna ask, how did this impact my business? So the wizard is one of those folks that we try to convince, you know, your ideas, even the wild ass ideas could be great. We can help you support that with the power of advanced analytics and data. So we have the crusader. The crusader is a person that will discount all evidence because they believe something is true. Again, earlier today in the session right before this one, we talked about the power of intuition, the power of expertise, but that power has to be combined with fact-based marketing. You just can't get away with it these days. When you look at things like uh, the merger between Heinz and, and uh, Kraft, 
and somebody like 3G Capital coming in and saying, you know what, we expect the marketing department to now engage in zero-based marketing, that means you better have your act together and you can't just run out and say, because I believe something is true, it is true. Now, those folks at Kraft are going to have to come up with some fact-based evidence to support the investment that they're making in marketing. They can be crusaders for an idea, they can, their intuition can play into it, but they can't just rely on intuition alone. They have to stop guessing and start knowing and start proving the value of marketing as a value creator in that organization. And so that's something that we have been crusading about ourselves for quite some time, and that's a belief and a crusader that we're, in, we're actually into. So then the next rogue is what I call the, the, the research junkie. The research junkie is a historian that typically is, considers themselves fact-based. Right? Hermione Granger was very fact-based. She knew everything about Hogwarts, right? So what she did was she had all of these different facts lined up. I always call it like they open up, they open up the book of research that they've done. And they look at every snapshot that they've done. That's what, that's what one-off research is. And there's a value to it. And it's important. Knowledge combined with continuous data can produce great results. But the snapshots alone cannot get you there. You must have continuous data in order to get the benefit of prediction. And that's the beauty of continuous data today, whether it's consumer records, transactions, uh, their third-party data sets. Uh, these are the kinds of things that can help you predict the future and help you to stop guessing and start knowing what the impact of marketing is going to be on your business. And my last rogue is Red Riding Hood. This person actually is fairly advanced in, being, in the data mindset, but they can get distracted off the path. One of our clients actually was, we were doing models for them every year, and their business to business group. The models did not show that television would ever be something they should be doing. But you know what? The power of a creative coming in and saying, hey, we could do this. We could get a Super Bowl spot. That's always my favorite. Hey, we could do a Super Bowl spot. Or better yet, we can own the rights to a stadium. And that just was too shiny and too pretty for her to ignore. And she, just like Red Riding Hood, straight off the path, produced five television spots that ran once. Because the sales force said, what the hell are you doing? This doesn't have any impact on our business. Our data showed that. Our models showed that. She found out the hard way, and she is now getting back on the path. And you can, still, you, you can still do these things if you want to have a naming rights or you want, to, you want to do the Super Bowl. The bottom line is what she needed to do was to say, yes, our models say no, but the reasons to do this can be even more compelling if you think, hey, it's going to really help the sales force out in terms of customer relations. Or employee morale will go up tremendously if we have a Super Bowl spot. That's fine. That's a legitimate strategic reason to do something like that if you think it's going to pay off in terms of employee morale. The data can say, now we know what's not going to happen. Now we understand that this is, we're managing everybody's expectations that television isn't going to have this tremendous impact on our business, but it might have a tremendous impact on employee morale, and that has a tremendous impact on our business. So that's the kind of thinking that she could have done had she not just completely dismissed and stopped doing the modeling process, which is what had happened. So again, she becomes busted. So I want to finish up today by talking about the five reasons that we believe everybody should get data savvy. And when we talk about being data savvy, again, it is applying the power of advanced analytics and predictive analytics to strategic marketing decisions and understanding how it's going to improve your business, how your activities are going to improve your business. One is you have the data, but you're not using it. This is huge. That is leaving money on the table. So 
you know what, your data that you have, that, that you're collecting, it can help you stop guessing and start knowing how to improve your business. Two, you have a wild ass idea. The data people like us are not against wild ass, ass ideas. We grew up in an executional environment. We grew up in, we were incubated at the Martin Agency. So we are into the Geico cavemen and into the little lizards and we're into all kinds of things. You can have a wild ass idea. Advanced analytics can help you understand what the impact of that idea is gonna be so you can manage expectations accordingly. Your target is large. Our, our target with BF Goodrich was huge. The budget was small. So then we had to understand who are the best customers that are gonna return the most value back to the organization. Your customer data can do that. All right, so we worked with them to identify and segment the gearheads in the United States, the gearheads that they had in their own database, and to help them connect the dots between what they needed to have happen in terms of their pricing strategies and their product development, and who was gonna return the most value and pay the premium price for their product. And they did it, let me say this, they did it with a $10 million budget, which was very small. If, you want to, if you're wondering, did your campaign work? Again, this is another reason to become data savvy, okay? You don't want to be wonder, wondering, did your campaign work after the campaign ran, which is something we encountered constantly when we were at the Martin Agency. So you want to know the, con the quantitative impact, not only of what you've done before, what you're doing now, and what you're doing for the future, that is the power of predictive analytics and advanced, and advanced analysis. And then five, your CFO is a marketing aficionado and has a passion for zero-based budgeting. We believe that, that zero-based budgeting is gonna be one of the, 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 the big um, trends in the next few years. And marketers are gonna have to be much more data savvy in order to be able to, uh, to fulfill the requirements of zero-based budgeting. So the real question is, are you ready to stop guessing and start knowing? So we have a quiz actually on coolerheadsintel.com that you can take, it's a 20 question quiz that will give you an assessment as to whether your organization is data, how, how data savvy your organization is. And we have some recommendations for you depending upon where you fall on that scale. So feel free to take the quiz and you'll find out exactly where you're standing um, in terms of your data mindset and how, and how data savvy your organization is. Now I'm done. Um, a couple questions? Just raise your hand. Yeah. You, you talked about you can have a wild ass idea and you said but make sure the data points to that. So. You know, one of the things I think about is the gecko, the geico, the pig. How did the, how did the data tell you that the pig was going to work? Because we knew, we understood what the content was that the that customers responded to. And of course, you have to remember, you know, Martin agencies had geico for two decades, I think. Um, and so there's a lot, there's a good pattern of history there. They're a direct response marketer, which means there's a lot of, um, information that you can use for test and learn. Um, and I will say this, a lot of people know the, you know, know the gecko, know the pig, know all of that. When Geico started with the Martin Agency, the, ad, the ads were charming and funny, but they were not crazy, okay? It took some time to get those learnings, get those data-driven learnings to understand how far could they push the envelope. And so now it's, you know, it's, it's relatively easy for them. You know, we talked earlier in the previous session about building trust and relationships. Data is a way to do that. And sometimes data is a way to do that quickly. Because when clients see that they have, you know, some data support for making decisions, they're willing to take that leap of faith because they can point, point to some of that information. So a quick follow-up. Both, both, both. What the critical piece is to have a very well, um, a very well defined 
measurement and analytics plan and a very well-defined data strategy, which could combine both client data or proprietary data with third-party data, syndicated data. We did a lot of really amazing things with um, data from MRI. Mm -hmm. oh. um, how accurate can you get in predicting revenue for the programs? Like how close can you get? You know, I love this question because I, and I don't, I don't want to, I, I always sound snarky when I answer this question. But I can, I can basically say that when, when people, he asks the question, how, how close can you get in terms of your predictions on, on revenue? Right. And I, a lot closer than you can get when you don't have it. <laughs> okay, so that's my snarky answer. Now, here's the thing that we believe in. We, we actually have a methodology that combines, again, I kept emphasizing this, human expertise and knowledge with data. And we build what is called a learning model so that over time, as we update that model with information, so we might take information not just from tracking studies, but from test market studies, um, as well as combined assessments from our clients in terms of what they think is going to work. And we do that in a, a discovery question, a session so that we know some of the assumptions that we need to make going into it. And what this does is it actually, it actually produces a more precise, um, relevant, an intuitive model than it would if we didn't do that process, if we didn't incorporate it. And there are a lot of people that model without any of that human input into it. So what we have found is that we're much more precise and much more, and much more predictive when we include human knowledge, human experience. We quantify that and put that into our models to predict, it, to predict sales outcomes. And we find ourselves in very good shape from that standpoint. Does that answer your question? Yes and no. I'll ask you a follow-up Okay. <laughs> uh, one more question. Okay. What tools do you use? Tools in terms of? So one of our key partners is Bayesia. Um, so we use uh, Bayesia and SAS. The combination of those tools help us, and that's and that's really the, 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 the what made us different as a as a company, and what made us different even at the Martin Agency with as a decision sciences group, is that we did a lot of process innovation. So we took a lot of tools that people were using for other kinds of analytics um, programs, and we started to innovate combining tools like Bayesia's platform with some traditional um, uh, advanced statistical programs and platforms in order to come up with what we consider to be, and it has turned out to be, more precise predictions, more, um, more confident predictions on the future of our clients' businesses. Unfortunately, with that, we are right at noon, uh, ready for lunch. Uh, big round of applause for a lot. Thank you. Thanks.